Hello, this is Dr. Gary Rose, and this is a lecture about what we know about opioid abuse and addiction. In this lecture, we will talk about the opiates and the opioids. The term opiates refers to naturally occurring forms of opioids, including opium, morphine, and codeine. Opiates also refers to the semi-synthetic compounds, including heroin. The term opioids is the term used for both synthetically and naturally derived compounds. The term opioids captures the whole class of drugs, but opiates is just a little bit more fun to say. Let's start with a brief history of opioid use in the Western world. As with the fiasco of Brexit, the fiasco of the opiate addiction belongs with the Brits. Having colonized both India and China in the 18th century, the Brits had ownership of a massive crop of opium in India that needed a market. So they packed the poppies onto their ships and sailed them through the South China Sea to ports like Macau, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. The Chinese were not happy about this new herb and what followed were the so-called opium wars. The Brits won and opium took hold on the mainland. <clears throat> These Chinese as immigrants brought the opium pipe to the US and one reads about opium dens in San Francisco in the early to mid 1800s. It is safe to say that opium helped build the great railways of the rest of the West. By the mid 1800s, the prototypic opiate addict was a Civil War veteran. Morphine was used extensively on the battlefield and thus sprouted the first generation of veterans presenting with pharmacodynamic tolerance to opiates as a consequence of chronic pain management. This does not mean that most vets were demonstrating signs of addiction, just that they got a bit grumpy if and when their morphine supply was interrupted. The wonders of the opiates continued to be discovered, and by the turn of the century, the modal opiate-dependent individual was your great or great-great-grandmother. Opium was infused into many of the medicinal remedies of the time. They were, quote, mother's little helper for this generation, employed to deal with cramps, general malaise, minor aches and pains, and for many, were a means of putting up with grandpapa. Every, everybody's favorite at the time was laudanum, 130 proof alcohol infused with opium. Heroin was synthesized from morphine by scientists from the Bayer lab in Germany in 1898. It is a semi-synthetic opioid because it is basically a chemical transformation of morphine. It was purpose as a cure for morphine addiction, which was now starting to become a public health problem, as everybody was discovering grandma's nasty little habit. Back in the day, most heroin users smoked or sniffed the drug. The potency of available heroin was very high, and there was no reason to use a less patrician route. Please remember that the US soldiers in Vietnam also mostly smoked heroin for the same reason. The hypodermic needle came along 12 years later, and with it, the hypothesis that injected opioids were not addicting because of the de different rate of action. This proved, obviously, to be quite incorrect. Trouble comes to Silver City circa 1900. More and more people are enjoying the pleasures of morphine, laudanum, and heroin, and the feds are not happy. Remember, this is happening at the same time as the temperance movement is being taken over by the alcohol is bad for you teetotalers, and the factory owners are getting more and more annoyed by their non-unionized workers showing up late for work, screwing up the machines, 
and demanding life-sustaining wages. How little things have changed. So the feds enacted the Harrison Act, which banned both the production and distribution of opiates and also cocaine. Interestingly, cocaine is not a narcotic, but because of the Harrison Act, has been incorrectly clumped into this category ever since. It's always about sociopolitics when it comes to substance use policies. And that was certainly the case with regard to the Harrison Act. This and the next slide provide you with quotations from the 1910 US survey report on opiate use. Perhaps in 1910, we needed a wall along the Mason-Dixon line. Take a second to read this quotation. And maybe we also needed a wall along the Pacific Coastal Highway. Of course, the truth of the matter is that since the post-Civil War era, the typical opiate user was a person of European lineage. At the turn of the century, there were four groups of opiate users in the United States. Those nasty Chinese immigrants on the West Coast, those morphine-dependent chronic pain patients, and then two groups of, shall we say, more ebullient users. Grandma and the girls were still having their laudanum cocktails, but never before five o'clock London time. And the teenagers, otherwise known as the bad boys, were smoking and snorting heroin. Just about everybody was happy except the veterans because the VA services still had troubles even back then. Then comes the Harrison Act and access to an availability of high grade morphine and heroin goes away, as well as the laudanum cocktails. Both grandma and the bad boys are forced to source their opiates from the street where the drugs are less pure and often cut with talcum and other dangerous substances. Given the loss of potency of the heroin, the bad boys of the inner cities are forced to move to injecting the drug. And what follows is increased disease, death, and crime. Sound familiar? A century later, and the US policy of supply side intervention continues to fail. So much for the war on drugs. The bad boys of the inner cities grow up and moved to the inner cities of the East Coast. The typical opiate user between the two world wars was the European immigrant living in the tenements of New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, DC, and Chicago. Eventually, these folks left New York City and moved to Long Island and Westchester, leaving their heroin behind. What would actually happen is they underwent successful natural change from opiate addiction, changing their use patterns as a function of changes in life goals and contexts. The new heroin addicts were the African Americans and Hispanics who moved into these neighborhoods. Thus Harlem was redolent with heroin addiction well before it became a minority neighborhood. And today, we are living with an awareness that opioid use has a lower threshold for initiation than it once did. Although there is some truth to the assertion that all sorts of valley girls and guys are misusing opioids, the reality is that the prototypic opioid addict of today is the same person who was the prototypic addict of 1970. He or she is a poly substance abuser with all sorts of tenuous socioeconomic familial resources. As already mentioned, the drugs of this class are derived either directly or indirectly from the opium poppy or are completely lab synthesized. As with all drugs of misuse, 
they have a variety of sites of action in the brain. For the opioids, the principal site is one or more of the opiate receptors, of which there are many, and one needs to know which opiate receptor a drug is involved with to fully understand the pharmacology of the opioids and of the medically assisted treatments. In addition to the action at the opioid receptors, the opioids also increase the availability of dopamine in the midbrain and thusly have high addictive liability. Again, please remember that the most likely explanation for opioid addiction is this dopamine involvement, not the fact that ongoing opioid use engenders pharmacodynamic tolerance and withdrawal. As opioid blood levels go up, one observes or experiences these attributes of the opioid pie. Death from opioid overdose is a function of respiratory failure. Remember, these drugs are all CNF suppressors. What goes up must come down. And in those who have developed pharmacodynamic tolerance, as the opioid blood level drops, withdrawal as a function of the body's accommodation to having the drug on board and slow readjustment to baseline, withdrawal occurs. And these symptoms of withdrawal are experienced generally for five to seven days post use. Importantly, for an otherwise healthy individual, opioid withdrawal is not life threatening and does not require medical supervision. This is different from alcohol withdrawal, where the risk of seizures and stroke requires screening and perhaps medically supervised detoxification. The opioid, the objective opioid withdrawal scale, OOWS, a checklist of opioid withdrawal signs used in medical settings. Very helpful if you're trying to assess opioid withdrawal. These three compounds come right from the poppy. Got a bad cough? Get yourself some codeine. A few fun facts about codeine, Vicodin, and street names for codeine. By the way, hydrocodone will do the same thing for codeine with regard to coughs. Heroin is a lab-based derivative of morphine, ergo a semi-synthetic opioid. Essentially, heroin is a reconfiguration of the morphine molecule to optimize the capacity to pass through the blood-brain barrier. It more rapidly enters the brain than does morphine, and once in the brain, converts to morphine. So the sites of action and neurophysiological effects of heroin and morphine are identical. The addictive liability and intensity of the high, however, is greater as a function of the different pharmacokinetics. Heroin use results in a more rapid delivery of a higher dose of morphine to the brain. A drug that has these pharmacokinetic properties has a higher addictive liability, which, by the way, is why crack is such a problem to be discussed in a different lecture. A few facts about heroin. Here are the various routes of heroin into the human body. Snorting is the preferred route, especially with high quality heroin. In this regard, think pharmaceutical grade heroin. It's preferred both for ease of use and for safety as the user has the most control over dose via this route. The fastest way to get a drug into your brain is always through the lungs, not via intravenous. So smoking is often preferred as a means to obtain an intense high. Any use of needles increases health risks markedly, in great part because a full dose is, a, is administered immediately, unless you do a small test shot first, which most street addicts won't do because it wastes expensive drugs. Also, 
all of the secondary health problems associated with needles make this route much more dangerous than our smoking or snorting. Think here about HIV, Hep C, sepsis, etc. Illicit drug users do not inject be because they prefer to inject. They inject because the potency of their street drugs are, or are presumed to be, low. Death occurs when the street drug is stronger than anticipated, or when it is cut with dangerous substances, or when one's tolerance has dropped because of abstinence, ill health, or incarceration. Here's a colorful chart of opioids that are currently available in the United States. All of these compounds have essentially the same sites of action in the brain. They vary mostly in terms of pharmacokinetics, bioavailability, and strength. These tablets are organized with regard to strength. You see that fentanyl, the big problem that it is on the street currently, is an exceptionally strong opioid. At this point, we might add to this chart some of the newer variants of fentanyl, such as cofentanyl. Hydrocodone, brand name Vicodin, is typically what the surgeons send you home with after day surgery. Oxycodone has been marketed forever as Percodan or Percocet and became much more famous and notorious with the fabrication of Oxycontin, a slow release version of this compound. Whereas the typical oxycodone tablet lasts four hours, oxycontin has a 12 hour length of therapeutic effect. This was thought to both better meet the needs of the individual with chronic pain and also to reduce addictive liability due to the longer half-life. This may have been the case for the individual for whom it was prescribed, or, but not for that ungrateful grandchild who copped grandma's supply. And of course, we know that the manufacturers and suppliers of Oxycontin knew this very early on in the distribution life of Oxycontin and didn't bother telling anybody about that. Due to the high incidence of abuse of Oxycontin, usually via injection, the original compound was reformulated circa 2010 to make it more difficult to crush, cook, and inject, resulting in the so-called crush-proof Oxycontin. A is the original compound, B is the crush-proof comp compound. This is actually a form of harm reduction, by the way. Fentanyl is a synthetic cousin to morphine, as are all the even more powerful than fentanyl, XXX fentanyls, mostly brought to you from our friends in China. Fentanyl is a very short acting drug that is often used in brief surgeries. If you have some day surgery where you have received general anesthetic, and then 20 minutes after the surgery, you're up and ready to boogie, you likely receive fentanyl. Fentanyl has also been used effectively in the management of chronic pain. When all else fails, go for the Imodium. Imodium is an opioid agonist with minimal CNS effects at therapeutic doses, but significant CNS effects, i.e. a high, at very high doses. However, it is also associated with cardiac crisis and death, so is probably best left for times with times when you regret having eaten that day old sushi. Do keep your ears open when talking with your high risk teens and other clients about drug use regarding potential ammonium abuse. <laughs>
Medication-assisted treatment is all the rave these days. In the world of opioids, there are three types of MAT, agonist, antagonist, and mixed interventions. Antagonists block the neurophysiological action of the opioids, typically by preferentially binding to the opioid receptor sites. Agonists have the same neurophysiological action as do the misused opioids, often in a more controlled, lower risk, and more easily modulated manner. Mixed agonists and antagonists do both of the above and have been very helpful in substance abuse treatment. Naloxone and its longer acting cousin naltrexone have a higher affinity to the opioid receptors to which heroin and other opioids bind, so they grab those receptors preferentially and block the action of the opioids at these sites. This is why Narcan works so well as a first order intervention in the face of opioid overdose. Once the naloxone reaches the brain, it essentially bumps the opioids off the receptors and results in an immediate cessation of the overdose symptoms. Now, Trexone, used both as an MAT for opioids and alcohol, decreases the euphoric effect of these drugs, but does not as readily interfere with the overdose. Narcan, by the way, can induce withdrawal in somebody who has developed pharmacodynamic tolerance, but does not now have opioids in their system. This happens because it triggers the pharmacodynamic tolerance withdrawal process. Children of addicts have been known to Narcan a parent to induce withdrawal, usually to get back at them for being such a miserable parent. The Narcan challenge is used in hospitals to better assess the degree of pharmacodynamic tolerance in an opioid user whose self-report is suspect. Here we have the classic Narcan inhaler. Take a look at these steps. Narcan can also be administered intramuscularly. A big problem, by the way, with Narcan emergency therapy is that the half-life of Narcan is shorter than the half-life of the street opioid and the overdose may start again once the Narcan is out of the person's system. This means that continued monitoring, preferably at a hospital, and multiple Narcan doses may be necessary. This is particularly important in the case of fentanyl overdose, as the fentanyl derivatives often quickly overwhelm the standard Narcan dose. Here is a very interesting form of IM Narcan delivery. This is available by prescription and reimbursable through most health insurances. Methadone and LAM, L-A-M-M, -M, are synthetic opioids that serve as agonist therapies. They are longer acting than street drugs and have fewer central nervous system effects. The buzz is less. Methadone use in the US was until recently limited to use as a withdrawal adjunct. However, now it is acknowledged that methadone use is actually a form of harm reduction, a way of providing a less risky way to use opioids, and doses have been adjusted to allow users to experience some level of intoxication versus just getting enough to stave off withdrawal symptoms. Now let's talk about bup. Buprenorphine is a mixed opioid agonist antagonist with these two actions occurring at different opioid receptors, by the way. Essentially, buprenorphine allows the user to experience a controlled level of intoxication and then blocks further intoxication. 
It's a bit like having your cake and eating it too. Buprenorphine is available in two formulations as Subitex, pure buprenorphine, and Suboxone, buprenorphine and naloxone. It is ingested sublingually, in other words, dissolved under the tongue. Subitex is used when there is still a chance of opioid withdrawal symptoms, but once the individual is well beyond detox, Suboxone is used. Why is naloxone added? When taken sublingually, the naloxone is inert. It doesn't do anything. However, when crushed and injected, the naloxone both blocks the action of the buprenorphine and will also trigger withdrawal symptoms. So naloxone was added to decrease the abuse liability of suboxone. There definitely is evidence of buprenorphine abuse. However, this tends to be limited to populations that do not have access to other opioids, for example, prison inmates. The various effects of buprenorphine abuse are listed here. Interestingly, a high-risk bup abuse population are those who have sought suboxone therapy and are on a waiting list. This makes a strong case for increasing the number of physicians who can prescribe the medication. Currently, one has to complete a training course, and one's caseload is severely restricted. This does not make sense in terms of a public health perspective on opioid use reduction. Whatever you do, do not mix buprenorphine with benzodiazepines, unless you are intent on suicide. Respiratory distress and death all often follow. Another interesting medication-assisted treatment is slow-release, otherwise known as DEPO, naltrexone, delivered via injection. This is potentially helpful in those who want to support an abstinence decision or to significantly reduce their opioid habit. However, it comes with many side effects and risks. One of the easiest harm reduction focused interventions would be to make available opioid drug testing kits. However, it's almost impossible to find an opioid assay, assay kit. Although there is now a fentanyl test strip, most of the DANSAFE kits work on stimulants or designer drugs only. Here we have some prevention messages for end users. Way to ways to decrease the likelihood of overdose and opioid use health problems. Avoid mixing. Avoid mixing drugs. Realize that a new environment can factor into overdose. Watch for decreased tolerance due to the function of being sick, being abstinent for a while, either self-imposed or other imposed, being in treatment, being in jail, um, using a, from a new source of drugs, always start with a small tester shot. You also have to be careful about where you use your brain becomes conditioned to the context within which you use. And in some ways, using in the same context, in the same place, at the same time, with the same people over and over and over again, protects one against overdose. If you're using in a novel situation and you're using a novel source of drugs, and for some reason your tolerance is decreased, your likelihood of overdose increases markedly. Know your drug supply. And if you don't know your drug supply or you're suspicious that there's maybe something different about the drugs you're using, always do a tester shot and always have somebody around. A healthy opioid user is a happy opioid user. Unfortunately, because 
opioid users in this country and IV drug users in this country more generally tend to be marginalized and stigmatized, the healthcare available to them is less than optimal. A lot of the health consequences, the negative health consequences associated with opioid use are a consequence of poor health and poor health care. If you're gonna use opioids, try to be as healthy as you possibly can. Watch out for the unintended consequences of drug cocktails. Synergy often occurs where the net effect is a multiplication of the separate effects of each drug rather than an additive effect. One plus one does not equal two, one plus one equals 100. Here's where self-medication becomes a problem. While waiting in the VA clinic, you start complaining to your buddy about how your doctor doesn't listen to you when you report that you're not getting better and how you feel like you always are getting, quote, the bum's rush. Your buddy tells you that his doc has put him on a new medication and he offers to share his script with you. Looking for symptom relief and not entertainment, you take his tablets and the ne next thing you know is you're en route to the emergency room in the back of an ambulance. Self-medication done intentionally to relieve symptoms, stress, pain, emotional distress can often have very negative consequences, especially when we're dealing with high potency drugs such as the opioids. Recognizing a depressant overdose. The difference between a really heavy buzz and being headed for the morgue. This is a lovely handout for your opioid end users with regards to overdose management, as well as some stellar advice about the 911 call. The last thing you wanna do is to scare off the EMTs. So let's talk a little bit about the current opioid crisis and how we might understand this. And we're gonna talk about this in terms of the public health or epidemiological model of disease. This public health model or epidemiological model asserts that if one wants to understand the cause of a given health problem, a given disease, you need to understand it from at least three perspectives, from the perspective of the agent, the drug, the host, the drug user, and the environment. So when we start, try to look for answers to the opioid epidemic, the opioid crisis, we look to each of these three components. The agent, the drug, what do we know about the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of the drug of abuse? Pharmacokinetics, what happens when you ingest the drug, how it gets from your mouth, from your lips, from your arm, from your lungs into your brain. And the pharmacodynamics, what happens once this drug is in your brain and in your nervous system? For example, we know that the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of fentanyl are such that they increase markedly the risk of adverse health consequences, overdose and death relative to heroin, morphine, and other compounds. So we need to look at the agent, the drug. What is it about this specific drug that increases the risk, the liability of adverse health incidents? How is this drug different than another drug? Where do we look for the answers? To the host, to the human. Why is this particular human at greater risk of using, misusing, abusing, becoming addicted to, and perhaps having adverse health consequences as a function of using, for example, street opioids. We know that there are powerful psychological factors involved in both the initiation and maintenance of drug use. Expectancies, what you expect to happen on the positive side as well as the negative side. 
the way you go about making decisions and make decisions with regard to smaller short-term rewards versus larger longer-term rewards. The, the quality of your brain is a function of your gen genetics. The quality of your brain is a function of your history of drug use. The quality of your brain is a function of previous history of traumatization. All increase or decrease, moderate the effects that that drug will have on you, both positive and and negative. These are all host factors that we need to look at. Why this human and not that human? Why do we have two humans with the same history of dosing of the same amount of heroin or cocaine and one becomes flagrantly addicted and the other doesn't? And the environment. We must look at the environment. Uh, how access and availability to drugs varies as a function of community. Uh, access and availability to alternative non-drug reinforcers. What comes to mind here were the great midnight basketball leagues of the 1970s and 80s, where inner city high school gyms were left open all night and you were able to access the gym as long as you weren't markedly intoxicated. We found that that protected against overdose and excessive drug use because people were choosing these positive, highly valued non-drug reinforcers rather than the drugs, the drugs themselves. Community norms about what's tolerated, what isn't, what's stigmatized, what's not. And certainly politics and public, public policy. So we need to look at each of these agents, each of these factors, both independent of each other and much more importantly in interaction. How does this drug interact with these host variables, interact with this person taking the drug in this particular environment? So as we start to think about the opioid crisis, we need to look at these, at these factors and factor them in to the opioid equation. What's going on with the agent on the street? What kind of individuals really are at greatest risk of opioid overdose? Is it the valley girl? Is it the typical poly substance abuser? To what extent is the overdose likelihood increased as a function of lack of knowledge and information? And certainly the environmental factors, the fact that uh, heroin users are marginalized, the fact that there are very few harm reduction programs, that there are very few safe injection sites, um, rejection of all non-abstinent outcomes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in addition to the triad of agent host environment as a way of thinking broadly about the opioid epidemic and the opioid crisis, here's another triad that's helpful as a thinking tool. When we think about the ways that a drug can cause problems, we can really think about the term problems as being three, as being something, an umbrella that covers three different classes of problems. For example, you can have intoxication related problems. And these are problems associated with a particular instance of high risk drug use. Driving under the influence is generally speaking an intoxication related problem. This person's blood alcohol level was too high, they got behind a wheel and they crashed. You can have health problems as a function of alcohol or drug use. Health problems are typically the kinds of problems that a Occur as a function of repeated use of a substance over time. Could be repeated high risk use, it could be repeated non high risk use. Cirrhotic liver, abscesses, the development of pharmacodynamic tolerance, physiological tolerance on a drug, these are all health problems. And one can have social problems. Social problems are associated with one or more low or high risk episodes of use. For example, if you're an underage user, any amount of alcohol use 
they incur a social problem. If you're in a relationship where the contract is zero use, any use of an illicit substance may get you tossed out of the big bed. Intoxication related problems, problems associated with a particular instance of high risk drug use, health problems, problems associated with repeated alcohol drug use over time, and, and social problems. So what do we know about the opioid overdose problem? Although most of the popular press and mainstream politicians assert that the overdose problem is fundamentally a problem of addiction, the only thing we really know for sure is that the overdose problem is an intoxication-related problem. People who misuse opioids on any one occasion are vulnerable to overdose and death. Misuse here includes uneducated use, as well as intentionally impulsive or stupid use. So if the problem is fundamentally an intoxication-related problem, the most compelling and direct solutions are to be found in the world of what do we do about intoxication-related problems, not in the world of what do we do about opioid addiction problems. Now let me restate that. The assertion that the person who overdoses on opioids is the opioid addict is based on a leap of faith, not on a leap of science. Anybody who ingests, injects, or otherwise moves into their brain a dose of opioids is on that one occasion vulnerable to negative health consequences of the opioid use. Whether this is the first time I've ever used opioids and the first time I will ever use opioids out of commitment to abstinence other than this one time and I'm trying this just to see what it's like, or I am a chronic craving level opioid addict, it is what is going into my brain into my body and my brain on this one occasion at this one point in time that determines my risk of opioid overuse. In fact, one can assert with a good deal of certitude that the overdose problem is not essentially a dependency related problem because as we previously discussed in, few, in other lectures, pharmacodynamic tolerance indeed serves a protective function. The more tolerance you have, the more protected you are against overdosing on a given dose of narcotics. This is both because your body has adapted to having the drugs on board and also very importantly, because your body becomes conditioned. Stimuli, situations, events, moods that are associated with drug use in the past come to condition or trigger the body to go into an adaptive protective, protective state. What kills craving level addicts is when they get a supply of drugs that is different in content and potency than anticipated, or when they use in a novel situation, or when they fail to take into account changes in tolerance associated with ill health or with periods of abstinence. So one can assert that the craving level opioid addict is all other things being equal, less likely to experience an opioid overdose than the naive user, who in some ways is most likely to experience an unintended overdose. And this leads to one of a number of obnoxious raves that I will rave and rant about before we finish. The opioid epidemic is inextricably interwoven with sociocultural, economic, and political forces. The problem will not be solved by physicians 
treating opioid dependence per se. The problem will be solved when we look beyond the physician opioid dependent individual relationship into the bigger picture. We must not only thoroughly understand what happens inside the body, inside the host, when this agent is ingested, we must also look at the context within which this host is taking this agent, this host is using this drug. We must understand what's happening inside the body and then put that in the context of the macro picture of socioeconomics, politics, and culture. This is where behavioral economics, a burgeoning field in the addictions world, comes in and is absolutely essential to understand. When are we as a society going to realize that recreational opioid use is here to stay and that we must educate people with regard to lower risk ways of using these drugs. Harm reduction has to include education. Harm reduction has to include accepting that at least for the time being, some people will make decisions to use street drugs. As Alan Marlatt asserted in the 1990s, abstinence is the ultimate goal of all addictions treatment, all drug and substance abuse treatment, but harm reduction helps us keep people alive along the way, the road to abstinence. And that's where this lecture will end. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please contact me at www.gary rosetraining.com. Contact me at garyrosetraining.com. Thank you very much.